sus... De esos cargos no reconozco ninguno, señor. Ajá. No fui detenido, así como se dice ahí. Ah, entonces, ¿cómo fue que, la, la, eso que usted me leyó no me sorprendió y le he sí. nunca. Uh -huh. Pero de repente no supe qué firmé, puse una huella, tampoco supe si en, en qué la estampé. Estaba vendado. Entonces, esa, no pude, no tengo otro, otra, otra opción. Uh -huh. Y pues ahora ya estoy aquí. Welcome to Humans of History, where we look at the personalities of historic figures. Today we look at the now mythical kingpin Miguel Félix Gallardo. And I do not use the word mythical hyperbolically. With his shadowy criminal career and a virtual silence from this man for over 30 years while behind bars, he remains something of an enigma. Yet, he went from being a state cop in the Mexican backwater of Sinaloa to becoming Mexico's most powerful drug lord. Not only this, but he was also the nexus of what was arguably the country's first drug cartel, a nationwide state-backed trafficking conglomerate based in the city of Guadalajara. Partly for this reason, few Mexican drug lords of the old guard have enthralled the world as much as Felix Gallardo. His reputation as a godfather figure precedes him. But if you've wondered what this man was really like in the flesh, what his tastes and his personality were, whether he was really as suave or as ingenious as they say, well then you've come to the right place. He has spent over 33 years in jail for his role in the torture murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena Salazar, now a martyr figure in the war on drugs. At the time of this video's recording, Miguel's fate hangs in the balance. He's 76 years of age, half blind, practically deaf, and his health is severely deteriorated. A district court judge has ruled for the man's immediate release and the continuation of his term under house arrest, but this has been challenged by the office of the Attorney General. So, Will he live out the rest of his numbered days at home with his family or decline and perish in his prison cell at Puente Grande? If after or even before this video you'd like to see an in-depth historical breakdown of this man's life and his pivotal role in the history of the Mexican drug trade, I strongly recommend part one of this series linked above. It traces Miguel's entry into and monopoly over the national drug trade with assistance of core members of Mexico's mafia state. You will also find the chronology of CIA collaboration with Mexican drug traffickers and how Miguel's story weaves into a much longer historic thread than is often realized. All right, enough chit chat. It's now time for the big character breakdown. So let's go. Miguel now has a reputation of being a peace broker in the Mexican drug trade, a man of deals before shots, of convincing arguments before executions, as one prominent journalist put it. He's known for his role in uniting the major traffickers of the era into a loosely run trafficking conglomerate which monopolized the national drug scene and kept violence to a minimum. There's certainly truth to this. The most common indication of this is that the Capo's downfall in 1989 almost immediately led to the infighting between key players of the now defunct Guadalajara cartel, who would go on to make narco history as bosses over major splinter cartels operating out of Tijuana, Juarez, Sinaloa, and the Gulf states. But here I'll be assessing and poking holes in the usual mythology. The picture that emerges is one of a cold, calculating killer who did try to avoid violence, but only because it was pragmatic to do so. It would be a gross exaggeration and misunderstanding to say he had a zero tolerance policy for any form of violence across his organization, or that he was above the sort of sociopathic murders of which some of his associates were capable. For this, we need to delve a little deeper into his life story, since we'll find that his background predisposed him for a general disregard for human life. In 1966, Miguel joined the Sinaloan State Police at age 20. His former lawyer, Feliz Garza, tells us he was involved in counter-subversive enforcement during the tumultuous year of 1968. It was a year of mass student protests all across the country, met with fierce anti-leftist crackdowns by the military and police. And though Sinaloa, at this point in the late 1960s, was less of a hotspot for the dirty war in Mexico, espionage and potentially interrogation and intimidation were likely parts of the job. 
even if there's no way to prove this. We've already seen the cast of characters with whom Miguel worked as an enforcer and bodyguard under Sinaloan state governor Leopoldo Sanchez Celis. Among these were convicted criminals, pitiless hitmen like Rodolfo Valdez or the Izquierdo Hebrard brothers, men who had been moulded in gruesome death squads active in the 1930s and 40s. If anybody wanted a classical education in thuggery, murder and cover-ups, these were the criminal equivalents of university dons. And as an enforcer in Sanchez's local protection racket for Sinaloan traffickers, it's unlikely he kept his hands clean, roughing up local smugglers and planters dodging plaza taxes or causing trouble. After finishing his official work with the governor, it's widely believed he became what's known as a madrina. The word madrina derives from the Mexican word madrazo, roughly translating to a beating or pummeling, and usually refers to a former cop hired out by active policemen to do their dirty work. Madrinas are off the books. They use the badges, the links, the powers of official cops, but since they're off the books, they're not easily traceable. So abductions, beatings, torture, or worse, these are the guys you want if you're a crooked cop and you don't want to lose your job or see the inside of a prison cell. If the madrina is caught red-handed, then you, the contractor, can deny responsibility by quite rightly saying it wasn't me. Madrinas are also typically well-connected to the drug trade. They know the main routes, the top smugglers, and those who are expendable. So they're good contacts for crooked cops looking to supplement their measly salaries by extorting drug traffickers or smuggling dope themselves. This might explain why Miguel left the force in the first place. When Sanchez left office in 1968, official police work wouldn't really have been worth Miguel's time. He likely realized that he could make far more money moving dope and making some pocket money doing dirty work for former colleagues or bosses in the state police. Given Miguel left the police force at some point in 68 or 69, and his first arrest warrant for heroin smuggling was shortly after in 71, it's likely he was simultaneously a madrina and a drug trafficker, working for local dons like Pedro Aviles and Don Lalo. And it should be said that these were violent businesses to be involved in in 1970s Culiacan. By 75, Sinaloa's capital was one of the murder capitals of the world. It's in this period that Miguel likely became desensitized to violence. And having been a street thug himself, he would have learned that there are many people willing to bend whatever morals they have left to maim and kill if the price is right. He also learned its value in the criminal underworld, a system where fear and intimidation substitute for laws and court orders, and where death, and more often violent death, replaces prison sentences. If you're a trafficker, violence and murder are also effective shortcuts to increase your power. The trick is, once you're close to the top, you have enough money to pay off those that will keep you alive and safe. You also need to be careful about which mouths to stuff with cash and which ones will spit it out and rat for a better price or advantage. Take it from a privileged middle-class YouTuber. These are all lessons Miguel would have learned moving up the ladder, and this is where his wits came in handy. The real Darwinian test comes when you've made it to the top to see how long you can stay there. Miguel certainly didn't shy away from violence during his criminal reign. When his business was compromised, he used violence as a show of force. Let's first take a look at how he has threatened and meted out brutal punishment on agents of the law. First, we have the case of Roger Knapp, a DEA agent working in the Guadalajara office during the first half of the 1980s. Having worked in anti-narcotics since 1966, he was in fact one of the main agents in Operation Padrino, or Operation Godfather. This was the intelligence gathering mission targeting Miguel's criminal empire, particularly his financial transactions. At some point in 1983, while he was cruising past Miguel's offices at Hotel Las Americas, Knapp was stopped and questioned by agents carrying badges from the Directorate of Federal Security, Mexico's national intelligence agency at the time. After a few minutes of probing the agents allowed him to drive off. Months later, in October 1984, just outside Knapp's home, gunmen fired at Knapp's car, the same one he had been driving that day when he was stopped. The hit was a direct warning from Miguel, and a taster of what he was capable of. Had the shooting taken place just five minutes later, Knapp's children would have been outside waiting for the school bus. The Knapp family had no choice but to return to the US. 
The question now arises as to whether Miguel made a deliberate policy not to harm law enforcers in order to prevent official retaliations that could damage his business. Knapp wasn't killed after all, only sent a warning. Mexican police were also suspiciously quick in arriving at the scene after being alerted to the shooting. It's believed this was to check that nobody was actually harmed. As for the torture and death of Kiki Camarena, it's been said Miguel would not have sanctioned his murder as he would have been careful not to kill a DEA agent and provoke an official reaction from the US. After all, the DEA with Operation Padrino had proven a worthy foe by tracing much of his cash flow as well as being responsible for several busts and confiscating money and drug shipments. Why would he have wanted to make an even bigger enemy of them? But then we should also remind ourselves that he didn't prevent Kiki's torture to the point of death or the order for his death blow. It throws into question Miguel's supposed power of foresight if he knew how the US would react, and yet he left Kiki in the hands of an erratic cokehead like Rafael Caro Quintero, was he really as diligent and careful as he's often made out to be? Some would say, well, it's possible Miguel might have been happy to leave Kiki in the hands of Caro Quintero, as well as the Capo's minions and DFS interrogators. Miguel might have thought that if Kiki died during torture, then state officials could cover up the story and make it go away. And if it got to the point where the US cavalry was brought in, then Caro Quintero and his trafficking associates would be scapegoated and thrown under the bus, not him. At least then he'd have less competition. After all, Miguel did evade capture for another four years. Caro Quintero and Don Neto, meanwhile, were arrested within less than two months of Kiki's death. So he might have felt he was sufficiently well-connected, powerful, and valuable enough to avoid prosecution. Or this is overthinking and Miguel, quite simply, hadn't thought this far ahead. DEA agents would probably side with this line of thought and scoff at me for giving the capo way too much credit. Maybe in that moment, he was just a short-sighted thug, probably high on crack cocaine like the rest of them. Maybe, given the number of high-ranking officials and traffickers involved in the torture, herd mentality simply kicked in, a feeling of anonymity on top of complete impunity that all meant there was little thought put into what would happen or what could happen if the torture went wrong. Let's not forget Miguel's actual involvement in Kiki's abduction and interrogation either. He was present at most, if not all of the meetings in which Kiki was identified and the logistics for his abduction were arranged. Kiki's photograph was found inside his home. This was the smoking gun before Kiki's body was actually found, which confirmed to DEA officers that the Guadalajara traffickers had been involved in his abduction. Miguel also sent his enforcers to abduct Kiki's pilot Alfredo Savala Avelar after Kiki gave up his name under torture. He was in the maid's room where Kiki was being tortured and was one of many to have taunted and harmed Kiki while hogtied. Hardly a scene that would have made the old madrina and thug flinch. And though there's evidence by eyewitnesses and Miguel's lawyer that Don Neto and Miguel were furious with Garo for having Kiki killed, well, they knew Garo's temperament. They knew he was on crack cocaine. Don Neto knew he was about to be tortured before leaving the room as he felt unwell. Miguel might not have seen the brutal torture in the middle to later stages, but he saw enough to have some idea of where it was headed. So Miguel's attitudes towards law enforcement are ambiguous. We can probably infer though that non-violence towards foreign law enforcement at least was kept to a minimum until the blunder of Kiki's death. Otherwise we would know about it. In my research, I found no evidence that he had any foreign law enforcers killed besides Kiki. Caro Quintero and Don Neto, meanwhile, had six American citizens brutally murdered in 1985, believing that they were with the DEA. Unfortunately, there were only tourists and Christian missionaries in the wrong place at the wrong time. There is evidence, however, that after the Camarena affair, he assimilated the lesson not to go after US officials. In April 1986, we're told by a cartel lawyer that he intervened to mitigate the excesses of a rather problematic drug lord. This was Pablo Acosta, the mercurial, gunslinging kingpin who controlled about 200 miles of the US-Mexican border, operating from the Chihuahua frontier town of Ojinaga. Acosta had ordered the abduction of a US photographer working for the El Paso Herald Post. The hapless journalist named Al Gutierrez was interrogated and tortured, but when Miguel discovered this, he intervened and ordered that the journalist be unharmed. This was just one year after the death of Camarena, and the murder of a US journalist would not do the cartel any favours. 
Gutierrez was driven out deep into the desert and then left alive. Ultimately, it would be a warning for the US media not to meddle with Mexican traffickers. But then Miguel's real reputation was a peacekeeper among criminals. So does he live up to this image? Once again, we have a blurred picture. First, as we know, he was a loud voice in encouraging cooperation among Mexican traffickers to collaborate on operations and bring them under the fold of a state-backed protection network. More cooperation meant a bigger pie and everybody could get a bigger slice. The Guadalajara cartel, or La Familia as it was then called, was the offshoot of this unifying drive monopolizing the national drug scene with strong links to the Colombian cartels. Violence was also bad business. Intergroup feuds and cartel infighting are costly, and more than just in financial or human terms. State governors, politicians, and local officials don't want the embarrassment of gang-related violence in their plaza. They want discreet, regular payments in return for their protection and little more. Some might be secretly active in the trade, but they still don't want violence because they're public officials. It would make their jobs messy. Noisy traffickers who become menaces, disturb the peace, they endanger civilians, and they attract investigation from good cops. They therefore risk unveiling those officials who are protecting the traffickers even messier. Miguel had enough contacts in politics for this to be self-evident to him. And he was clever enough to make discretion an important feature of his operations, at least in his criminal career. As we know, Miguel, the legitimate entrepreneur, was often seen in public. His low profile served him well. Various anecdotes point to his role as a problem solver and a godfather conciliere figure, given his power and seniority. If he met with other bosses, he insisted they and their retinues always be unarmed, knowing that even the pettiest of squabbles between some of the organization's more hot-headed hillbillies could rapidly devolve into a bloodbath. He apparently conceded that alcohol at these sorts of gatherings, quote, brings out the animal we have within us. Often, when important meetings were held, he would pay the military to provide security around the premises. By his own account, Miguel was so powerful that he was often called on to act as a sort of vigilante figure, in true godfather fashion. In his diary, he wrote about a particular episode in 1986. Minor caveat, this was likely written with the view to have it published by his family to rehabilitate Miguel's image after he was arrested. Take its contents, or at least the spin on it, with a pinch of salt. So, while he was reading the morning paper one day in 1986, he read a headline that a family of seven in Mazatlan had been butchered while watching television. Even the family cat had been slain. Before leaving his home, Miguel was intercepted by his wife, asking him if he wanted breakfast. He showed her the article and said, who could possibly eat with that on their mind? I'm going to sort this out. When he arrived at his office, Miguel summoned his most senior police chiefs, demanding, quote, I want those responsible for this massacre, whoever they are, and I want them alive and in jail within 72 hours. A manhunt followed at all levels of his intelligence network, from policemen to hairdressers, doctors to taxi drivers. True to his word, the assassins were eventually found and incarcerated. When the capo interrogated one of the assassins, he asked him the reason for the most baffling part of the whole crime, why did you kill the cat? The assassin replied it could be a witness in the afterlife. Parenthesis, that doesn't really make sense, does it? If he's worried about the cat being a divine witness, why is he murdering it and sending it to heaven? Anyway, moving on from the dead cat. Though he might have avoided and even punished violence, a criminal organization like Miguel's practically depends on it, as we've already seen. Just because he avoided violence, it doesn't mean he couldn't tolerate it in any form. You certainly do not reach and maintain a position like Miguel's without it, and it's believed Miguel ordered the deaths of hundreds. He had an army of thugs, paid hitmen, DFS agents, dirty cops, these men crushed competition in Guadalajara and other trafficking hubs and made sure everybody paid up. All of his associates could count on this manpower to resolve their own issues. An important insider source tells us that upon the foundation of the Guadalajara cartel, 
those who weren't part of the ring were in grave danger. Top boss Jaime Herrera Nevares, operating from the state of Durango, turned himself in to the local general to be safe in prison. When he was released, he fled the country, and Sinaloan trafficker Miguel Urias Uriarte also disappeared. Among Miguel's enforcers were incredibly violent individuals, like the sadistic El Chapo Guzman, responsible for thousands of murders throughout his criminal career. These were as savage and heartless as they come, and many were by his own hand. Another was Manuel Salcido Uceta, known as Cochiloco, or Crazy Pig. The future kingpin, headquartered in Mazatlan, was said to take great delight in torturing his victims an inch away from death before putting a bullet in their skull. And there's reason to believe Miguel was himself behind one of the most horrifying cartel crimes of the 20th century. This was the massacre of the family of Hector Palma Salazar, alias El Huero, a middle-ranking lieutenant in the Guadalajara cartel and future boss in the Sinaloa cartel. After Palma was caught stealing a drug shipment, Palma's wife, Guadalupe, was seduced by a Venezuelan trafficker and finance whiz named Rafael Clavel Moreno who was working for Miguel. After eloping with Guadalupe and fleeing with her children, Clavel managed to convince her to withdraw over $7 million from one of her husband's bank accounts. After this, he killed and decapitated her. Her head was sent to Palma in a cool box. Two weeks later, the two children, aged five and four, were thrown off a 500-foot bridge in Venezuela. It's said Clavel filmed their fall and sent the tapes to Palma. The case was never fully settled in court, but most sources point fingers at Miguel as having masterminded the killings. Some authors have also blamed the Ariano Felix brothers, but those that have can't seem to explain a few things. One, the fact that Clavel was personally working for Miguel, valued for his extensive money laundering knowledge and contacts. Two, the killing spree Palmer embarked on in the wake of his family's slaughter in which he murdered over 30 people connected to Miguel, including associates, lawyers, and family members. Palmer was no friend of the Ariano Felix brothers and was already on the brink of war with them, yet he was convinced Miguel was the brains behind the butchering of his family. We also have an interesting and relevant anecdote from Guillermo González Calderoni, the famous police commander who arrested the capo. In an interview held in the year 2000, he told us this. In April 1989, when he arrested Miguel in Guadalajara, the capo tried to bribe him with five or six million dollars in exchange for his release. Calderoni told him it was non-negotiable, to which Miguel allegedly said, you know that if you turn me in, you're a dead man. You're going to die very soon. Calderoni allegedly retorted that it was in Miguel's interest to cooperate, or else he would be the dead man. Calderoni threatened him with the release of certain incriminating tapes he had in his possession. These tapes listed the names of various people who had been murdered on Miguel's orders, former associates, their family members or contacts, without Miguel's people knowing. Apparently their crime was threatening his operations. So it appears Miguel was not beneath murdering the family of his lieutenants and associates if they crossed him, breaking the supposed mafia code not to touch families and honest citizens. As for his efforts to keep the peace among traffickers working with him, well, there's reason to believe he doesn't quite live up to his reputation on this front either. For this, we have the account of Hugo Tafoya Sanchez, an early aide to Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who went by the alias of El Fugaz. According to Tafoya, Miguel did very little when El Chapo decided to put $1 million bounties on the heads of each one of the Ariano Felix brothers, escalating their feud to all-out war. Tafoya said that Miguel brokered just one meeting, hosted in a house in Culiacán. El Chapo and Ramon Ariano Felix attended, along with their retinues, all unarmed, as was Miguel's policy. Miguel asked them why they were feuding, and when they gave their reasons, he asked plainly whether there was anything he could do to prevent war. When they both insisted that there was no avenue for peace, as it was a matter of honour, Miguel promptly backed down. He accepted that war could not be avoided. He guaranteed them safe passage as long as they were in Sinaloa, having paid for protection from the military, but said they'd be left to their own devices once they'd left the state. So here we have a gangster who understands the nature of violence 
and the inflated macho culture among Mexican traffickers, which makes violence difficult or even useless to curb. And this is one deviation from the usual narrative. We should perhaps reevaluate the time-honored trope that Miguel was the only capo who, through the umbrella of the Guadalajara cartel, could keep the feuding factions of the Mexican drug scene under control. Another thing to consider is Miguel had some role in actually heightening tensions. When his nephews, the Ariano Felix brothers, began mismanaging their operations and compromising the cartel's anonymity, he sent El Chapo in to take over operations in Guadalajara. The brothers were relocated to Hermosillo in Sonora, with less work and lower pay. Though this was in the interest of efficiency, the Ariano Felixes were sidelined, and their frustrations were left to fester as El Chapo stole the limelight. Miguel's reshuffle in fact planted a seed for the war that was to come. So to conclude this topic, we have a cold, pragmatic approach to violence. Since he was reared in it as a young street thug, he was unfazed by its ethical implications. For business purposes, he promoted peace and cooperation as it was more lucrative, and he avoided war to the greatest possible degree, but within reason. There was an understanding of its advantages, its necessity for enforcement, as well as the raw fear factor that comes with brutally punishing traitors and threats, as well as their families. <laughs> Miguel's ruthlessness in securing a monopoly over the national trafficking scene is only proportional to his energy. We're talking about an extremely high-functioning person with the drive, the greed, and yes, the high intelligence to build and sustain an empire. Think Fortune 500 CEOs and you'll generally find the same traits. He'd always had a strong business sense. As a young child, he'd ride to neighboring towns on his bicycle selling knitting materials and other odd bits, where he'd also buy fresh produce like cheese and poultry to sell on the local market. Other early ventures involved work in road construction and owning a tire business in his mid to late teens. Family members and people who knew him growing up record him as serious, clever, and extremely hardworking. His criminal career is perhaps a model for drug traffickers. It's one of constant reinvestment and diversification in both legitimate and illegitimate businesses. In the mid to late 70s, he was trafficking large shipments of heroin, cocaine, and to a lesser degree, marijuana. He bought hundreds of houses and apartments, owned or had stock in dozens of hotels, bars, and nightclubs across Mexico and the US. He had a trucking company, a crop dusting business, and cinemas in Mazatlan. He even owned stock in two airlines and was a board member of two Mexican banks. Schmoozing with political dignitaries, tycoons, and bankers, generally relentless networking would have been essential for him to go from a street cop to business magnate and capo. We'll look more at this later. By the 1980s, he was Mexico's number one cocaine trafficker and the Medellin cartel's top man in Mexico. One thing that often goes understated is that Miguel's operations helped modernize the trafficking trade in Mexico. In part one of this series, I talked about how the DFS and the Mexican state more generally helped centralize and organize the drug trade, providing state-of-the-art technology like radio systems and automatic weapons. But something that Miguel pioneered was the large-scale use of banks. Banks became extremely important trafficking assets, as important a component as the manufacturing or the smuggling of dope. They enable traffickers to move millions of dollars quickly and efficiently. As historian Benjamin T. Smith vividly put it, quote, gone were the nail-biting days of carrying around cash-stuffed suitcases and waiting in bars and hotels for tense handovers. Particularly for cocaine trafficking, banks became crucial as the entire supply line stretched from the Andes in South America all the way up to the major US cities. The system ran something like this. Hard cash from cocaine sales in the US was collected, mainly in California, and then trucked to Mexico. This was to avoid US anti-money laundering operations. Once the cash loads reached Guadalajara, the money was deposited into local banks through bankers on Miguel's payroll. Local payments were made to local members of his organization, like bodyguards, traffickers, and state officials. To make international payments, sums were withdrawn by means of cashier checks in amounts of ten to fifty thousand dollars. These were then wired to banks across the US. 
One of Miguel's main accounts, discovered by the DEA, was in a Bank of America branch, based in San Diego. Miguel was moving an estimated $200 million every week through this account. Bankers in the US then forwarded money by check to cocaine wholesalers and smugglers in South America. So you see the sophistication of the system. Miguel's many years of networking with the financial elite gave him access to some of the greatest financial talent in the country, with money brokers like Tomás Valle Corral, who were part of his inner circle. This, needless to say, was on top of all his other businesses and investments. With his wealth, his web of contacts in all sorts of fields, and his political power, you see why he was such a focal point in the Guadalajara cartel. It made sense for Capos to coalesce around him. He knew practically everybody a Mexican trafficker needed to stay afloat. If you were a peddler and Miguel invited you to do business, well, you'd have to be a fool to say no, as his network was the safest and most lucrative to be in. So what traits allowed him to achieve all of this? First, as stated, boundless energy and drive. Miguel would have worked like there was no tomorrow because when you're dealing with drugs in Mexico, there's always a chance that there isn't a tomorrow. And when he wasn't at work work, he was courting politicians, fellow traffickers, bankers, commanders and generals, and businessmen all over Mexico and abroad. He traveled frequently, especially between Sinaloa and Jalisco, but also in North America, South America, and Europe. He always found time for public ceremonies, weddings, baptisms, quinceañeras, these were good ways for Guadalajara-based traffickers to telegraph their power and impunity. Miguel never shied away from photos, often appearing in local papers. This is the biggest possible flex a drug lord can do. With nearly a dozen arrest warrants to his name, quote, he was the most wanted man in Mexico and the least pursued, as one author put it. Even when he was finally in jail, the man managed to find projects. Miguel wrote in his diary how, while at the Reclusorio Sur, he was considered a medium-risk inmate, and for his talents was often put in charge of the other prisoners. By his account, the deputy was so impressed by Miguel's management skills that he bought him five canvases for him to pursue his painting. The deputy also encouraged Miguel to create work for some of the inmates. With the help of an engineering friend, Miguel oversaw the manufacturing of soap and vinyl paint. The capo boasted that the paint was much cheaper than store-bought paint, and that the prison officials were so impressed with the quality, they bought 10,000 litres of it. Two, we're talking about a man who was fiercely intelligent. All those who knew him, from Guillermo Calderoni to his lawyer Felix Garza, the only person, by the way, that Miguel saw for several years while at the maximum security prison of Altiplano, testified to his exceptional wits. Javier Cuello Trejo, the double-dealing prosecutor who helped bring Miguel down, said this in an interview. You can't even imagine how much natural intelligence he has. It stands to reason you don't reach Miguel's position without some genetic blessings. As one of the world's biggest traffickers in the late 70s and 80s, then virtually unrivaled in Mexico from 1985 till his downfall four years later. He would have had extraordinary organizational skill, not to mention strategic vision and a keen eye for business opportunities. Bear in mind that unlike many of the capos from Sinaloa, his family doesn't appear to have been involved in drug trafficking. He moved his way up from a dirty cop, made excellent use of the criminal and political contacts under state governor Sanchez Silis, then generally appears to have played the right hand again and again, until of course the torture murder of Kiki Camarena, which brought down the House of Cards. Miguel was especially unique for, and I hate to say this, his much fated sophistication, as opposed to the crudeness of many Sinaloan traffickers. This gave him a certain X factor, with the charisma and the authority to become a godfather figure in the trade. So let's take a closer look at this. What's interesting about Miguel is that he did have some of the macho coarseness of Sinaloa and cowboys. He mingled easily with the hillbilly trafficking clans. This would typically have been at wild parties with the trappings of northern rural Mexico. So cockfights, dancing horses, mariachi bands, 
barbecues, and of course, tequila. But then Miguel appears to have been one of the few from Sinaloa to have blended in with Mexico's political and financial elite in ways that many traffickers could not or would not do. Bear in mind that Sinaloans and many Mexicans from rural drug-producing states often distrusted the government and the state for their perceived corruption and neglect of the honest, hard-working peasantry. It begs the question if this was ever cause for tension between Miguel and other members of the Guadalajara cartel. Miguel's childhood and upbringing might account for this sort of adaptability. He was brought up on a ranch, after all, in a fairly poor part of Sinaloa. He would have grown up with kids from rural families. He went to the local primary, the local high school. But then his family wasn't exactly poor. The fact he went to university is an indication of their middle-class leanings. Poorer peasant families tended to take their children out of school once they'd assimilated the basics that they would need for manual agricultural work. It appears Miguel's parents wanted their children to pursue work outside the family ranch. In an interview, the youngest of the Felix Gallardo sisters called her family, quote, decent and of good stock. Perhaps a revealing marker of the family's class identity is she told her interviewer, rather snobbishly, that her family were not huarachudos, basically meaning sandal-wearing peasants. So there might have been a social climbing drive in the family. Joining the police force with his brother was Miguel edging one step close to the city and away from the ranchero life. Miguel had the manners, the social skills, and the wits to impress local commanders, and in the late 60s, he was assigned as personal bodyguard to none other than the state governor and his family. This is one hell of an achievement for somebody in his early 20s. It's a testament to his abilities, but also perhaps an emphasis on social climbing and reputation within the Felix Gallardo family. Image was important. Remember throughout his reign, Miguel never minded having his photo taken and constantly attended public events. If he was shown as a respectable businessman, then people would believe it. The eminent journalist Elaine Shannon put it like this, Miguel, slim and quiet, masked his lower class origins behind a slick veneer. He was, by all accounts, a pitiless killer, but he could put on a tailored suit and look the part of a fast track entrepreneur, which in fact he was. But then to say his business-like attributes were just for show would be misunderstanding his character. Miguel was discreet and serious by nature. He never swore, apparently. Amado Carrillo's lawyer wrote that he always seemed to premeditate every word that he uttered. Several other people who knew him have called him unusually austere. We've seen how this favoured him as an extremely unproblematic trafficker for corrupt state officials. As DEA chief Edward Heath put it, quote, This wasn't a man who wanted to attract fame or attention to himself. They'll go around and call themselves by a particular name, brandishing guns. He wasn't like that. He was one that wanted to control, coordinate, but very quietly. This and his business-like tastes and behaviours made him an almost romanticised figure by the DEA, a myth that survives today. In his tastes, he was usually one for moderation and refinement. He donned slick suits and designer clothes, with bespoke Italian boots. Fun fact, Miguel's feet were abnormally large, and he needed his shoes custom made. For more casual attire, he often wore flared jeans and checkered shirts. Rarely was his hair not combed with a neat party. He liked nice things, but not for effect. He collected luxury watches, but we're told he never wore them. He had a few sports cars, but rarely drove them. He drank whiskey and brandy sparingly. His ranch complex on the outskirts of Culiacan was impressive for the time, but in no way lavish. He certainly wasn't one for jewellery, showy sombreros, or the type of bling flaunted by other narcos. Now, there were exceptions to the rule. Colombian contacts tell us Miguel once completely went off the radar for three days, only to discover later that he'd been holed up in a hotel with associates, a mariachi band, and prostitutes. This, we're told, was fairly irregular, and paled in comparison to the sorts of parties had by other Guadalajara-based traffickers. We also know that he freebased crack cocaine, but then he appears to have been more of a social smoker, differentiating himself from the crack addicts that riddled the cartel's ranks, from Don Neto and Rafa Caro to Amado Carrillo and Pablo Acosta. Many of Miguel's hobbies and interests were also more enlightened, shall we say, than those of other traffickers. He claimed he'd read over 2,000 books by the early 90s, most of them behind bars. 
In his younger days, he was reportedly interested in mechanics and radio communications. The police who raided his home found everything from Voltaire and literary classics to books on Mexican law, government, and history. He was interested in history, particularly Mexican history, and was apparently well-read on the Aztec, independence, and revolutionary eras. His collections on Mexican law and government sated a natural curiosity, but they also provided resources for his own criminal career. Miguel's lawyer, Felix Garza, noted one of his client's key attributes was his understanding that legal battles were won with time and money. He understood the value of amparo judges. Amparo is Spanish for protection, and amparo judges are federal judges who can issue writs of protection on certain individuals who are claiming the violation of their constitutional rights. So these judges are vital assets for any legal defense against the government and great tools for traffickers. Miguel made sure he had the right amparo judges on his payroll and some of the best Mexican lawyers money could buy. It meant he could shake off 14 arrest warrants throughout his career. Meanwhile, his trial for the torture and murder of Kiki Camarena from 1989 until 2017 stands as the longest legal case in Mexican history. While he was a free man, according to his lawyer, he sponsored some of the leading Mexican artists of the era, including Jose Luis Cuevas and Marta Chapa. He owned an original from the latter, which was apparently destroyed during a police raid. In prison, he would paint and make woodcuts to keep himself stimulated. Miguel also left us with 35 pages of memoirs, totally unique for the drug trafficking world. It appears he was the first Mexican Don to have done so. Given Miguel's high literacy and his opinions on social and political matters, it's a wonder, in fact, that he hasn't written more. In these, we catch a glimpse of Miguel the man, as he would have us see him. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt and explore just how genuine its contents are. This part will navigate extremely murky and mine-laden waters. As you'll have read, we'll be exploring apparent signs of Miguel's social conscience that is a sense of concern for the problems and injustices of society. We'll mainly be drawing from three sources. One, Miguel's memoirs mentioned earlier, written while at the Reclusorio Sur. Two, an interview with Miguel's lawyer, Felix Garza, conducted by Mexican journalist Diego Enrique Osorno. Three, Miguel's written responses to a questionnaire sent to the capo by the same journalist. These memoirs were published by his family on a now defunct website named after the capo that they ran. Members of the public could submit questions. These questions were forwarded by family members to Miguel while behind bars and his answers were then transcribed and uploaded. His answers and memoirs among the rest of the website's contents were ways for Miguel and his family to try and rehabilitate his image. Needless to say then, it is an emphasis on his positive legacies and or views that represent him in a good light, while denying or glossing over his criminal and homicidal acts. Garza's accounts should also be taken with a bucket of salt. We don't know if he had consorted with Miguel prior to the interview. His account will most definitely be biased being Miguel's defendant. The capo would have given him cherry-picked information, depicting himself in a positive light. I should add that the lawyer also got to know Miguel at a time when his prison conditions were extremely harsh. Given this and Miguel's persistent condemnation of the very true denial of basic human rights at the hands of prison officials, it's possible the lawyer's account is skewed by empathy. Seeing a victim at a telephone booth every day can make you lose sight of a man's violent and socially cancerous criminal career. So, Gadassa said that Miguel was the sort of man who always put the less privileged first, even if it was to his own disadvantage. One of the first things he said about the man was that, quote, he's a person who displays humanitarian impulses that you don't find in most. Reading Miguel's memoirs, a big chunk of them talks about the state of Mexican social justice and equality during the 1990s. He stands in the minority among Mexican and other Latin American capos for making targeted social criticisms. This comes across in passages like these, quote, The highlands of Mexico are largely neglected. There's no higher education, no roads, no medical centers, communications or security. 
There's no such thing as microcredits for the countryside, aid for agriculture, timber, husbandry or mining, only repression. It also seems he was profoundly impacted by Operation Condor in 1977, and understandably so. It was a crushing military crackdown on drug-producing regions which had devastating socio-economic effects especially on Miguel's native state of Sinaloa. I refer you to part one of this series for more details, but Operation Condor was perhaps more Cold War era state terror than it was a responsible drug eradication program. And tens of thousands of innocent peasants paid the price. Perhaps it was this, seeing the results of Operation Condor, where Mexican soldiers committed human rights abuses and stripping the population of their lands and farms, and many others like it, that might have led to this sort of disenchantment. In Miguel's eyes, the cartel's plantations, as well as its manufacturing and distribution networks, created jobs for those who needed them. Or well, that's how he liked to justify it. Interestingly, prosecutor Cuello Trejo claimed that Miguel was difficult to interrogate because he didn't fully see himself as a criminal. In Miguel's own words, he and his associates, quote, didn't kill or rob or impoverish Mexicans like many politicians did. His involvement in the drug trade was all business. He believed he was acting within his moral rights, even if he was acting outside the law. He didn't create drug abuse or the market for drugs, he was simply an entrepreneur, supplying a demand created by the same, quote, foreigners that brought him down. And he was taken advantage of a corrupt socio-political system that predated him. By his lawyer's account, Miguel was also the chief donor for the library of Sinaloa's main university, and he sponsored various other universities across the country. He personally paid the rent for several student apartments in Sinaloa and funded housing for Sinaloan students in Guadalajara and Mexico City. He was named the godfather of Sinaloa University's law and political science departments between 1984 and 1989. Miguel's actions weren't just limited to students and universities, hospitals benefited from his patronage, and he owned a pharmacy. He also subsidized construction and husbandry, allegedly providing agricultural aid to the people of Sonora, Sinaloa and Jalisco. When journalist Diego Sorno asked Miguel about his political views, he said he thought capitalism was only useful if it provided jobs and equality, that it was a force for good as long as it was regulated. When capitalism devolved into excess wealth and the abuse of workers, it was no longer a social good. Again, fairly ironic, considering the slave-like conditions of the peasants toiling the plantations of his associate, Rafa Quintero. With regard to socialism, Miguel stated that he supported any collective association designed with equality and fairness in mind, without attaching himself to left-wing ideologies. Another great irony, considering his counter-subversive work as a policeman in the late 60s, was that he confessed to having been a great admirer of the Cuban revolutionaries. By his lawyer's account, he also showed great affinity for historical figures like Benito Juarez, Nelson Mandela, and Napoleon, all iconic for being torchbearers of freedom and democracy, in theory anyway. Bear in mind, Mexicans from drug-producing states like Miguel's native Sinaloa often harbour strong anti-state feelings. Many are resentful towards what they see as a detached, corrupt uh, urban elite lining their pockets off the labours of the poor, making these states breeding grounds for Robin Hood figures, unfortunately often traffickers. To add yet another contradiction, Miguel was reportedly extremely religious. Who knows if this influenced his humanitarianism? His parents were devout Catholics who fought in the Cristero War, a 1920s uh, uprising of Catholic Mexicans in response to anti-clerical legislation which was widely viewed as atheistic. If that wasn't enough, Miguel had a relative who was beatified by the Pope. Allegedly, Miguel even met Pope John Paul II. The moment was captured in a photograph which he had framed during his confinement at the Reclusorio Sur. While behind bars, he exchanged letters with him, and later Pope Benedict requesting blessings for his family. According to Cuello Trejo, the capo heavily subsidized the Catholic Church in Mexico. Even from behind bars, Garza tells us he'd send candles for the funerals of people in his circles. On one occasion, he bought a whole mortuary just to close it down, because he felt the owners were overcharging for their services and exploiting the grief of family members. Was this Miguel's way of atoning for his sins? Taking all this into consideration, you could make the case that these offerings were designed for the social good, with no strings attached. 
Miguel placed special importance on education and employment, for example, as means to tackle crime and delinquency. His philanthropy could well have been PR stunts, perhaps designed for eventual recruitment, or they could have been genuine. The big irony, of course, is that he himself fostered a climate where crime and delinquency ran rampant while supplying substances that destroy lives and stunt communities. Signs of repentance are important for any character breakdowns of criminals. I must say that in the case of Miguel Felix Gallardo, there are virtually none, and the few we do have seem rather disingenuous. In his memoirs, Miguel writes that shortly after his arrest, when he met Edward Heath, the DEA's regional director in Mexico, he professed his innocence in the case of Kiki Camarena and said, quote, You've all said I'm crazy, but I'm not crazy. I deeply regret the loss of your agent. Well, yes, no doubt he regretted it. Had it not happened, he could have carried on being a free man and carried on making billions. Next up, we have the 2021 interview with Mexican journalist Isa Osorio. This was a shock to all of us who thought we'd never see the enigmatic crime boss speaking in front of a camera. Miguel offers condolences to the Camarena family and laments Kiki's death, saying he knew he was a quote, good man. But these comments are almost immediately discredited by the statement that he, quote, did not see why he was incriminated for the case. Now, we have seen that there is a mountain of evidence connecting him to Kiki's torture murder. So this statement is a complete slap in the face. Need I list the evidence? Kiki's photograph at Miguel's house, which was found by the DEA after Kiki was reported missing. Eyewitness reports that Miguel was at the Guadalajara house when he was tortured. Need I go on? That he was seen tormenting and slapping Kiki. Or that he ordered the abduction and torture of Kiki's pilot, and the fact he went into hiding during the DEA crackdown. Generally, Miguel has denied absolutely everything. The 2021 interview is laughable. He said he'd never even committed a crime, not even selling drugs. He was just a businessman with investments in agriculture and cattle. Just a case of mistaken identity, apparently. He denied ever meeting Pablo Escobar or knowing Don Neto or Rafa Caro Quintero. Hmm. This even contradicts the memoirs written by Miguel's own hand, containing myriad references to his criminal career. One line, he even starts off writing, quote, We the dons of the old guard, before waxing lyrical about how much more noble he and his associates were compared with crooked, uh, extortionate politicians. So Miguel's quite clearly in denial. He constantly plays victim, a pattern you find in his memoirs as well. To any psychologists out there, I'll allow you to offer your potential diagnosis. The legal explanation for this is self-evident, but to any psychologists out there, I'll leave you to pile on the theories. He stresses he's a living corpse, that he doesn't see any hope of being freed from prison, and that his family is already preparing for his death. It's a powerful sentiment, but we do have to question ulterior motives. Miguel makes a point of accentuating his admittedly severely deteriorated health. He has the cameraman zoom in on his blind eye. He also sings the praise of sitting Mexican president López Obrador, a man who has previously made public his support for the old capo's house arrest on humanitarian grounds. Lo and behold, the president has recently backed a ruling from a court district for Miguel to be released and placed under house arrest. Another interesting point is this. At the end of the interview, Miguel stressed that he wished to see Isa Osorio again. This stance is completely different from those which he showed towards other journalists in the past. Julio Scherer Garcia was one of the very few journalists in the early 1990s who actually interviewed the capo while behind bars. The story goes that after Scherer started poking around with some difficult questions, Miguel promptly cut the interview short. He stood up, courteously bade him farewell, and walked away from the phone booth. Over the decades, he has declined countless interviews. Osorio had been trying to get that interview for years, nearly half a decade. Her first big moment came after the release of Narcos Mexico, when the jailed capo sent her a handwritten letter complaining about his depiction in the show. 
and claiming he was innocent. She urged him to go on national television and tell his version of the story. At first, he refused this, but then he finally conceded last year in 2021 after repeated follow-ups from the journalist. The conditions for the interview were flawed. Miguel is now practically deaf, so the questions we hear Issa asking are more for our ears than for Miguel's, who is instead reading pre-written questions off pieces of paper. This was one of the interview conditions set by Miguel's lawyers. You might have noticed the cuts between her questions and his answers. This is the time Miguel was reading and preparing his answers. So what I'm saying is there was little opportunity for Issa to challenge him on his answers, at least not without awkwardly writing down her counter-arguments and using up limited interview time. Prison officials had given her and the cameraman just 20 minutes to conduct the entire interview. And the clock ran from the moment they stepped into Puente Grande up to the point when they went back out. So you're probably all shouting behind your screens, Get on with it! Yes! Get on with it! Well, my honest suspicion is... Get on with it! Alright! God! My suspicion is Miguel thinks Issa Osorio is a useful accessory, allowing him to peddle his own defence and win over some public and political support. The fact that Osorio had encouraged Miguel to give his side of the story would have been an encouraging sign for any jailed criminal. But if it hadn't occurred to him the extent to which the interview conditions could favour an agenda, he likely realised during and after it. Ten full minutes. First ever televised interview of the mythical capo. Tens of millions of people in Mexico and abroad would watch it. And best of all, little to no wiggle room for scrutiny from a journalist who could do little more than nod politely at his answers. That he not only accepted the interview in the first place, but then said at the end while leaving that he wished to see her again, well, that's a clear departure from nearly 30 years of turning down journalists. I must confess that this is a cynical interpretation. He might have just liked and admired her for her persistence and grit, rather than it just being a case of him using her journalism for his own ends. I thought I'd leave it with you anyway. The claim that he's a living corpse, and presumably indifferent to his fate, yet he's still so strongly in denial about his criminal background, should be scrutinised. We can only hope that should he concede a second interview, different conditions might allow Osorio to properly hold him accountable and ask the hard questions. It's also worth wondering the impact that interview has had on very recent events, the district court ruling for Miguel's immediate house arrest with presidential backing. Let's see how this pans out. As usual, if you're watching this in some close or distant future and you're aware of an update, thanks for sharing it with viewers in the comments. Miguel Angel was certainly a one-off in the Mexican drug trade. He was an unusual character, religious, austere, and discreet, but also high energy and extremely entrepreneurial. At six foot two or one meter 89, that's quite tall by Mexican standards, he was an imposing figure, but also soft-spoken and gangly. He had some of the macho crudeness of Sinaloan cowboys, but also the airs and snobbery of the wealthy elite. To call him refined though would be neglecting that he was a merciless thug and killer. It's this tension between energetic coalition builder, between slick godfather figure and sociopathic killer that has beguiled millions. But we should mainly remind ourselves of the grief, the destruction, and the misery this man has inflicted on so many lives, from the murdered victims of his aggressive, monopolistic drive, to the countless casualties of drug addiction during and after his criminal reign. He also fostered widespread corruption in Mexico, a country he claimed to love, to hitherto unprecedented levels. He paid a heavy price for this, and his story is one of near-classical hubris. With the arrest of Miguel Felix and the collapse of the Guadalajara cartel, the Pandora's box of the Mexican cartels had been opened. Whether the absence of Miguel's leadership and brokering paved the way for this, or whether conflict was inevitable even if Miguel had stayed in power, well that's a matter of debate. But the resulting bloodshed and violence of the Mexican drug war plagues the region to this day with no end in sight.